Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chemistry and Society. This is our chapter one mini lecture, and I want to go over everything with you that I think is most important. However, you are still required to read the chapter and read the notes to prepare for each quiz. So in chapter one, we're talking about portable electronics and we're taking the periodic table with us. So these are some guiding questions to think about as we get started. And this is a reflection that you're actually gonna do on your own. So I'm not gonna do that for you. All right, so a touch screen is probably something you're using right now to watch this video. And you are may not even be thinking about the chemistry involved in your touch screen. But uh, these are the things that you can think about on your own when you are interacting with a touch screen. Now let's move on to matter. Everything that has space and mass is considered to be matter. So even if it's air, a lot of times students will tell me that air is not matter because you can't see it or air isn't matter because it has no mass. And that's not true. If you wanna prove that there's air in the room right now, just take a deep breath. If you felt something going in your lungs and something coming out of your lungs, then there was matter in the room. That matter is a gas. So gases are particles that are far apart. They have a lot of energy. They're bouncing around all the time. We call this the gas phase. Particles in the liquid phase are closer together and they're always touching each other and bumping into each other, but they're able to move around. So just think about liquid water. And then particles in the solid phase are very close together and they're arranged in a repeating arrangement, which we call a crystal lattice. That is the technical term for this repeating arrangement of atoms and that is found in the solid state. So this is what I just said, basically, solids, liquids, and gases, gases. and then out in the um, deep space, we have our plasmas and stuff, which we're not going to worry about in this class. And then this is a table, oops, for you to read over on your own about the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. This is probably something you've been doing since about the third grade, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. You can just review that on your own. And so... When we talk about matter, we talk about it as being a pure substance or a mixture. So within pure substances, we have elements and we have compounds. Elements all contain the same type of atom and compounds contain two or more types of atoms. And then within mixtures, we have things that are physically combined and they are either a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture. Hetero, meaning different, has uneven composition, and a homogeneous mixture, homo meaning same, has a uniform composition. Now, I'm just going to take a second to tell you that I have a full lecture posted on Canvas called Classifying Matter, and it literally is an entire lecture on just this topic right here. What kind of substance is it? How do I figure out if it's an element or a compound or a mixture? And if it's a mixture, which one of these is it? I really encourage you to go watch that lecture that I have on Canvas called Classifying Matter, because right now I'm just kind of going over the high points. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, you should go watch the lecture video. It's very beneficial for you to spend a lot of time because you're going to have to identify substances. If I give you a substance, you would need to tell me if it's an element, a compound, or a mixture. So for instance, if I said, okay, what's carbon dioxide? You need to be able to know that that's a compound. And the best way to figure out how to learn how to classify is by going onto the Canvas page or my YouTube channel and watching the video called Classifying Matter. All right, so here are some more practice problems for you to try on your own. You can just pause it and give this a try. All right, let's talk about the periodic table. On an exam, you will be given a periodic table to use. And in uh, chemistry and society class, you do not have to memorize the symbols for the elements. So your periodic table will look just like this. It will have the name, it will have the symbol. So a vertical column is called a group. 
Sometimes that's called a family too. So this is group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven, et cetera. And then a period is a horizontal row. So this would be period one, period two, period three, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what I just said. Um, some of the periods, I mean, some of the groups are named. You're not gonna need to memorize those names for chemistry and society. However, in future chemistry classes, you most definitely would need to know that. All right, so here are the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals. This group's called the noble gases, the halogens, okay? So this is not something you need to memorize for this class though. So here's an example for you to try on your own. Now the symbols on the periodic table, like I said, they are not required memorization for chemistry and society. However, in future classes, you betcha you're gonna be memorizing those names. But in chemistry and society, chem 1115, you don't have to memorize symbols. I'll give you a periodic table and you just need to be able to look at it and write it correctly. Okay, the, the it's always got the first letter capitalized and then the second letter is not capitalized. So just make sure if it's one, then it's just a capital. If you wrote lowercase o, that would not be correct. And then likewise, if you wrote uppercase S and uppercase I, that would be incorrect as well. So all you need to do is be able to use the periodic table to find the symbol. All right, like I said, elements versus compounds, I strongly encourage you to go watch the video on classifying matter. Elements are all one atom. So if we have iron right here, that's what these little spiky looking things are. Those are iron filings. They're stuck on an, a magnet here. If you have iron, that means every single atom is exactly the same. Whereas in a compound, you have two or more elements that are chemically combined. So this is rust, iron three oxide. And then here's another compound. This is a magnet. All right, this is a video that you can go check out on your own about how to see atoms. Atoms are very, 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 very small. They're not something you can see with your regular microscope that you use in biology class. You have to use a very special microscope. And this is a video that you can go watch on your own time on how to do that. Now, there's also another video that I have on my YouTube channel and on Canvas on scientific notation. This is the way scientists write very large numbers and very small numbers. So I'm not gonna spend time going over this right now because I have another video on Canvas and on my YouTube channel that discusses how to do scientific notation. If you've done it before, just review over it. If you've never done it before, then definitely go spend some time learning how to write numbers in scientific notation. The purpose of scientific notation is to just get rid of all these zeros. We don't like having a bunch of zeros in our numbers. And then in the metric system and in science in general, we're gonna use prefixes to tell how big something is or how small something is. Now for us in Chem 1115 in Chemistry and Society, you don't have to memorize these prefixes, but again, you bet you're gonna be memorizing them in future chem classes. So just wanna introduce that to you now. And this is just an example that you can try on your own, but again, it's not memorized in this class. Okay, I also have another lecture out on my YouTube channel and on Canvas about atomic structure, which I also encourage you to go watch because this notes is just the high points. It's not gonna talk about every single detail. So please go watch my video called Subatomic Particles. So an atom is composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. That's probably something you know from your childhood. Protons are positive in charge, neutrons are neutral in charge, and electrons are negative in charge. We find protons and neutrons in the center of the atom, which is called the nucleus, and then all the electrons are located around or outside the nucleus. So here's an example of two different um, atoms. One's hydrogen, one's helium. So the nucleus right here contains the one proton. It actually doesn't have any neutrons and one electron. For helium, we have two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus and two electrons orbiting out here. So using the periodic table, you would need to be able to figure out how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in each of these atoms. Again, I have a video on my YouTube channel that goes over explicitly 
how to do that. It's very easy. It's not a complicated um, calculation, but I want you to go watch that video so that I don't have to repeat myself. Okay, so this is a breakdown of how the elements exist in Earth's crust. Um, but it's important for you to know that they're, they're not hanging out there as pure elements. They're hanging out there as compounds. And so that's why it's important for us to be able to write chemical compounds. Because when we talk about iron in the Earth's crust, for instance, it's not just sitting there like iron. It's sitting there in these compounds. Or oxygen in the Earth's crust. It's not really sitting there as oxygen gas. It's sitting there in these carbonates or these oxides. So it's important for you to know when we're talking about elements in the crust or wherever really, that they're not hanging out as elements, that they're actually there in compound form. Okay, so important distinction here, chemical versus physical change. A chemical change alters the composition and it creates a new substance. So if you eat a sandwich for lunch, when your body breaks that down into its very small components, that's digestion, right? That's creating a new substance. The bonding is different. Cooking, burning, decomposition. If you throw a banana peel out in your front yard and watch it for a few days, it decomposes, right? That is a chemical change. The substances are different. New, new bonding. Whereas a physical change doesn't alter the composition. So if I take an ice cube out of the freezer and I sit it on the floor and I watch it melt, it's becoming H2O liquid from H2O solid. So H2O becoming H2O, that's not a change in composition, that's just a change in state. Boiling, freezing, condensing, those are all physical changes too. If I have a piece of paper and I cut it with scissors or I tear it up, those are all physical changes too. But if I take that piece of paper and I burn it, that would be a chemical change. So be able to identify chemical and physical changes and um, explain the difference between them. So here are some examples for you to try on your own. Just pause the video and give it a chance, give yourself a chance to try it. And then when we talk about um, sustainability, when we're talking about environmental issues this semester, the three pillars of sustainability are environmental, social, and economic. So you'll hear this thrown around from time to time this semester. And then here is an example about recycling and just what is in a cell phone, right? So your average cell phone has 300 milligrams of silver and 30 milligrams of gold. How about that? Maybe that's why they're so expensive. And so it's important to recycle, right? Because you've got all this valuable stuff in your phone. And other metals are also highly needed for your electronic devices. So batteries, magnets, speakers, chips, lighting, converters, and your advanced electronics and weapons, those all require these rare earth metals. So it's not like it's just this thing where, oh, I've got my smartphone and there's no chemistry involved. There's a lot of chemistry involved in your smartphone and a lot of valuable uh, elements that are there as well. So that's the end for our first chapter in chemistry and society. Again, there are some additional lectures that you need to go watch that I uh, did not go over in this video because those videos already exist. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And I hope you have a great day. Bye.